And later on the show, CBN, EFCC, pro banks and firms over alleged forex racketeering. I'll be hanging out with Babaji De Kolade of the studio and Majid Jamu. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen, uh, for being on the show this afternoon. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so we're going to start journalist hangout. Journalist hangout start now. Now let's begin with the provision of the palliatives to citizens in the face of economic hardship. The senator representing Lagos East Senatorial District, Tokumbo Abiru, uh, decided to reach out to vulnerable people in the area rather than throwing a party to mark his 60th birthday. Senator Abiru, uh, rather than throwing his party at his 60th birthday, Senator Abiru, who distributed food items to vulnerable people in his district to cushion the impact of economic hardship on them, noted that the pain would not last forever. Senator Abiru, who has been supporting the needy every quarter, increased the food packs to 10,000 food to vulnerable households across the 98 wards in the 16 local council development areas and local government areas in Lagos East Senatorial District. While distributing the food packs to his constituents, the senator who was represented at the occasion by his media aide, Eni Tolu Koton, said he shelved all social plans and decided to provide the food. The senator you know, often reaches out to the less privileged you know, in his constituency. And uh, coincidentally, the senator is clocking 68 you know, today. And the senator has decided to you know, extend the same gesture you know, to our people across the 98 walls in the 16 LGAs and health CDAs we have under Lagos' senatorial district. He thanked his constituents for the opportunity to serve them and the party leaders, as well as President Bola Tinobu, for his impact in his political journey. Some of the beneficiaries thanked the senator for the gesture. During the festive period, Christmas, Easter, as the case may be, he always and continue to, so we are not surprised. Thank you for this um, great thing you've done for the society. It really means a lot. And even when I got the text, I was not expecting it. I was like, I have to call some people around there, like, let me to check if it's real, low, you know, because of the security. But when I got here, I noticed it's very real. Uh, my husband nominated me for this food package. Uh, and I got a message yesterday that I should come and receive it from Senator Tokumbo Abir that I should come here to receive it and I'm surprised. I don't even expect I'll be called. I'm grateful for what um, Senator Abir is doing to us all the time. He never forgets us. I never for once let us down. Being support of the, the Senate campaign, he has never for once let us down. He has always been there for us, providing for us in the little way he can do. Recall that Senator Tokumbo Abiro had disbursed more than 150 million naira to vulnerable people under his COVID-19 financial relief scheme. Now, there you have it. Uh, Bikio, let me start with you. We're beginning to see politicians, you know, uh, do a lot of giveaways, reaching out to the vulnerable, especially uh, vulnerables within their constituents. Uh, what do you... Uh, constituencies rather what, what do you consider you know striking in what uh, senator tokumba Biro has done this time around yes what in, in that food pack are uh, different um, greens and all that so it's not simply distributing bags of rice it's giving the people options mm. you know um, that's gary the man other greens so the people have a variety uh, of uh, food in the food packs that he has uh, distributed. We challenge these politicians, we challenge the governors. We are beginning to see them respond. It's been slow from some of them, but as we have seen with um, Senator Yayi, Lamlekon, Yayi, Senator Ifan Yuba. In fact, Ifan Yuba took it to a whole new level, an unbelievable level. 
the stadium was jam-packed. 30,000 bags of rice on the field. Buses, tricycles, sewing machines, all kinds of stuff he brought. And he also attracted big wigs within the APC to join him in what he called a mega empowerment scheme. So this is what we want to see because they have the means to do it. And it doesn't cost an arm and a leg to make people happy at this time. Dangote has invested 15 billion naira to distribute grains across our country using um, foundations, NGOs and all that to reach every part of Nigeria. Kudos to him. He has so much money. People always attack him that, oh, he's not generous, this and that. Look at what he's done. 15 billion committed to grains and it's not, uh, the, it's not in government. That's significant. This is what we want our government to do. And we are seeing more and more lawmakers do it, more and more governors do it. You saw um, Governor Ibanji giving 300 million to local councils and saying, go and get grains for people. That is after he came out with an intervention uh, uh, scheme costing billions of naira and breaking it down to various sectors you know so um, it's, it's looking good it's looking good if they can all do this i'm not saying it to wipe away all sorrows yeah. but at least it will get to somewhere it will, it will get somewhere right uh, mj it's quite interesting if if they have decided to throw a party i can remember the president also saying that all the newspapers, the pages of the newspapers should be, you know, used for something. They, what, the money they want to use to congratulate him should be used, you know, to reach out to the vulnerable. This is something, a, a good feat, because if they decided to throw a party, it means that even the vulnerables won't, be, won't have access to some of the crumbs that will be coming out of this party. Most, most of those things will, will go to waste. How, how do you see, you know, what they're doing this time around? Yeah, um, one key thing about uh, what Senator Tukumbo Mikhail Abiru has done is the fact that um, the way he distributed those items, 10,000 households across 98 um, wards in his constituency, and I'm mean, covering uh, 16 local governments and LCDAs in the Lagos East uh, uh, Senatorial District. Um, I mean, it was spread, and from the look, I mean, from the looks of those we are seeing on TV, you can see that these are people who actually need these things. And it was organized in such a way that <clears throat> almost seamless, at least from the people who have been there and from the videos and pictures we have seen. Unlike um, what happened, or the, the disaster that happened in Nasarawa. So, while distributing these things, there must also be logic to it and some strategy so that what we are trying to um, avoid, I mean, we don't end up causing more uh, problems. So, kudos to um, uh, Senator Tukumbo Abri. And like they said earlier, a lot of uh, our uh, well to do and the, 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 the lawmakers and the corporate organizations are now coming to the aids of the people and I think um, the cries of um, <clears throat> a beam power a beam power I think is, is, uh, is, 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 is coming that is coming down gradually Dangote as we speak is in Lagos where through uh, Dangote Foundation today with I think about uh, 100 between 150 and 200 thousand bags of rice uh, two or three days ago, it was Kano with 200,000 bags of rice. And something Nangote has been doing during the fasting period, mm. I know that it sends at least four trailer loads mm. of spaghetti, indomie, and um, pasta, rice, and sugar, and salt to all the states of the Federation, at least each of the states. Every Ramadan, at least I am privy to that. And he's still doing that. So the rice intervention is doing now is outside what he has been doing. So um, if more of our uh, National Assembly members, uh, both Senate and reps, right. could uh, 
uh, borrow, the, borrow from the leaf. Yeah, borrow from this leaf. I think um, uh, we, we will be better for it. That's I right. mean, a, a lot of governors are also doing different sort of things. I mean, uh, the other day, Soludo, it was providing tractors for about 800 tractors. Mm. And also, you could see the president had to go to uh, uh, Niger State to uh, inaugurate the uh, agri mechanization revolution of uh, the governor of uh, Niger. So these are some of the right. uh, things that... Uh, yeah. It's good that we're seeing all of these and uh, yeah. we just hope that Nigerians will benefit as much as they, they've actually planned to, to reach out to uh, the, the most needies in, in the country. Uh, let's move on because of our time. In law, it is said that something cannot be built on nothing. This is to uh, discourage acting against legal guidelines. The Port Harcourt Division of the River State High Court has ruled that Celestine Omehia is not a former governor of the state and as such not entitled to pensions met for the gov uh, former governors and their deputies. Ruling on the matter brought before the court by Omehia, Justice Daketima Kio ruled that the counterclaim by the state government demanding that Omehia repay 695 million naira is lacking in merit as it did not compel anyone to pay him the money. Let's share this story by TVC News Uche Okoro with you. Celeste Nomehia occupied the office of the governor from the 29th of May 2007 until his removal by a Supreme Court judgment in October of the same year. Eight years later, the River State House of Assembly recognized him as former governor. But on the 6th of October 2022, the Assembly in a resolution withdrew the recognition. The presiding judge, Justice Dakati Makiu, held that Mr. Omehia is not qualified under the River State Governor and Deputy Governor Pensions and Fringe Benefits Law No. 6 of 2012. He said the House of Assembly did not have power to recognize Mr. Omehia as former governor in 2015, contrary to the judgment of the Supreme Court which nullified his election. On the case before him, the judge also noted that the High Court cannot deliver any judgment contrary to the Supreme Court. <laughs> Justice Kyo subsequently dismissed the relief sought in the claimants originating summons for lack of merit. The court held that in the eyes of the law, you know, affirming the decision in the celebrated case of uh, Rotimi Amechi versus Heineck, you know, the court also affirmed the fact that in the eyes of the law, that Sir Celestino Mayer was uh, never a former governor and should not be accorded that status, the status of a former governor, you know, because he was not. And therefore, he's not entitled to benefit from the River State uh, former governors and deputy governors uh, law, you know, pensions law, and the fringe benefit. And that is not entitled, and therefore he should not be recognized. In its 2022 resolution, the Assembly also ordered Mr. Omehia to refund the sum of about 697 million naira paid to him as pensions and benefits. But the court agreed with Mr. Omehia that such order was unrealistic and impossible to implement as the money has been spent. The defendants, however, have an option of going to court with a fresh suit to pursue the refund. I will not want to comment on that, uh, considering my position on the, as a civil servant, I'm a government lawyer, so I wouldn't want to comment on that. Uh, that is, uh, the matter is quite a sensitive one, and uh, it will be left for the government to decide. The court rejected the plea to dismiss the suit and award damages, but instead directed both parties to bear their respective costs. I won't make any comments. Uche Okoro, TVC News, Port Harcourt. Please, pardon me for that. Well then, we are going to make comments in the studio. Uh, Bikyo, let me start with you. Um, it was said that the reason why Sayasin Mehia was made a former governor, was recognized as former governor, was because it was part of the Article presidential campaign uh, for, I mean, yeah, Article was supporting Article. And then in 2023, when we get lost out in uh, able to uh, clinch a ticket for presidential election, he still, Mehia still continued to support Article. But then, that claim, we get denied. What's your, what's your take on this? Um, this whole controversy was instigated by Jason Wiki. There was no reason in the world for Wiki to get the house to recognize Celestino Mejia as a, a governor. 
as a governor, as, a governor yeah. as far as the law is concerned, the law does not see him as a former governor. The law wiped his slate clean. Even if he was governor for 100 years, the moment the Supreme Court declares somebody as governor in his place, it's not known to law as somebody who was governor. And it's not entitled to benefits. It's just similar to um, what happened in Anambra. Chris Ngige was governor. But he was defeated in the tribunal. The, his opponent proved that he didn't win the election. So in the eyes of the law, he was never governor. That's the way it is. That's the, that's the way the law looks at it. But because he was on wicked side at one point, and because our governors literally have the assembly in their pockets, governors these days determine who becomes speaker. Absolute nonsense. A governor has no reason to determine who becomes speaker. And even chair, chairman of And the, you want us to believe that they are, they are uh, independent. independent. Yet it is a governor who chooses speakers for you. I don't so. You sit there and allow a governor to choose your speaker for you. A governor even went as far as sitting down in Bermuda State when they were choosing a speaker. He didn't get out of the place. They should have walked him out. But they didn't have the liver to say, Mr. Press, Mr. Governor, we will not continue this process until you leave us alone. Because it's our, it's our own personal affair. Yes, he sat there. Because he was not sure of himself. He, 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 he sat, sat there just to make sure that his own person, mm. the person that he wanted, became the speaker. Where is the, where is the honor of the assembly? Where is the independence of the assembly? And when Celestine Omehia moved away from supporting uh, Wike, Wike quickly moved against him, got the house to reverse a decision that he caused them to take. For God's sake, Wike is a lawyer. <laughs> His wife is a high court judge. But you, know law, that, the, you know that the, the decision of the Supreme Court is a decision that no mortal can override, can countermand. Yet, you make sure that they made him, uh, now he fought you, or he refused to support you. Support you. Then you turned against I was in River State at the time when this decision was taken. Amazing. You know, politicians believe in the zero-sum game. If you don't back them, they will throw the kitchen zinc at you. That's what they, that's what they did. And now, the shoe is on uh, the different foot now. The man supported a, a different person. We can fetch bad. After all the favor that I did for him, look at all the money that one person got. Can we make progress Six, in this country? 690. One person, 697. Million. Uh, million. Uh, but these were supposed to be benefits that accrued to him. As yeah. what? Well, he was, As what? He was never As governor. He was never governor. <laughs> MJ. He was never governor. Uh, MJ, let me come to you. You know, based on what BK said, you know, the judge actually wrote that the demand by the state government for a mohia to refund 695 million lacked merit because it did not compel anyone to pay him. This means the 695 million in the words of the governor uh, of the president yeah. is gone. See, before Majid talks, <laughs> let me add something. <laughs> Well, it's always better to enlighten our people. Young ones are watching us. A lot of Nigerians don't have a sense of history. Do you know that what Wike did to Meher? Do you know that Faoshe tried to do it for Shegwoni? Abi? Yeah. Did yeah. Shegwoni agree? Mm -hmm. No, no. He did not agree. He didn't agree, yeah. Come on, that's a decent man. Mm -hmm. And that's why they still respect. So it, it takes it takes being decent ah. mm -hmm. to be invited to. I mean, it takes being human to, come, be and to come and chop. Mm -hmm. And then you now feel no, this is not the right thing for me to eat, and that makes you decent. You see, right. um, the River State government under Wiki, or rather Wiki, and the River State House of Assembly made a joke of governance and of the Supreme Court judgment and the law. And the, law. the Supreme Court said. Ruled that which were which the uh, justice um, uh, Dake, Daketima Kyo retreated 
while giving that ruling, that the Supreme Court ruled that Omehia was a mere imposter, stroke imposter, and was never a governor. Mm. That was how the Supreme Court described him. That's, I mean, uh, uh, the, the only the stop door, uh, the stop shot of calling him a, a medicine interloper, uh, mm. uh, quote and unquote. So, um, for Wiki to now award to cost the uh, House of Assembly to award him six hundred ninety-six million, and, and when you woke up from there, I mean, so six uh, yeah, yeah. million. I mean, and you now woke up and discovered that oh, it's no more on your side. You said it should reform. So the judge, the judge said. But the judge said it should reform. He said they should remove the benefit. The, be, the they benefit. They recognize him as a former yeah, governor. Yes, no, they paid him. No longer be the former be, 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 former governor. And then he should reform. Refund. Uh -huh. And the judge now said. He never asked for it in the first instance. So why are you telling him to refund? So the judge, the judge just wanted to help him. <laughs> in the National Assembly, when you lose an election, mm -hmm. when uh, you lose an election, they tell you to refund. Though. And that's uh, probably because, yeah, uh, no, National Assembly, I think, no, you go away with the money you have made. They tell you what? courts, I've seen courts that are ruled, if I die, when he defected to. The, you know when you defect, you lose it. Oh, yeah, you lose your seat, yes. The court ruled that it should refund, refund all, the, all the earnings. So, I also say, well, they looked at him, that guy, will this man be able to pay this? <laughs> and he just, he right? just like, and he, he has just, spent the money. They just like, of course. <laughs> so, I, I think this is a lesson to our uh, demigods, because the governors see themselves as them go. They want to control mm. virtually everything. That's right. They put the out of assembly in their pockets and dictate to them what to do. And except in a few states where we have semblance of uh, real uh, 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 checks and balance between the house of assemblies, I mean, we can see like we, can, we can see that happening in Lagos. Lagos. You can see how Lagos, I mean, how the state of Arizona stops some people from being commissioners in Lagos. Yes. Mm. And the way the Lagos State House of Assembly scrutinizes the budget of Lagos State, and at times they even increase the budget for the governor. They say, no, you, yes. you need to spend more. Some ministries, they will say, no. Yes. So they also, they also move money from here very to quickly. that place. So, Sorry to pause very quickly, because of our time. So what other options do you think are there for Celestine May here, especially talking about politics of things? Do you feel... He should go and join the Fubara camp. He should be praying that another court doesn't order him to pay. Mm. <laughs> because it's not impossible. Well, the best man who is fighting him is formidable. Mm. And he's a very, very Resilient fighter. tough cookie. Mm. Yeah, because he is the one, he's the if, one that went to court in this if, case. So. If they go, and they are not happy that they didn't tell him to refund. Mm -hmm. yeah. They may appeal. If they appeal and they say, oh, maybe I should refund, he will hate the fact that he, 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 he agreed to have anything to do. And the, the, the luck we have now is that, I mean, uh, uh, Fubara will see this as a victory for him mm. uh, because, I mean, uh, it's wicked that wanted him to refund. So the court has said he should not refund. So he might just allow it to lie low. So it's, uh, kudos to him. Anyway, we'll see how, how things, you know, continue to pan out, especially with these um, issues um, or issue within the River State um, politics. Let's move on. Uh, there is no doubt in the fact that insecurity ravaging some parts of Nigeria requires drastic measures to curtail. As such, President Bola Tinubu has reiterated his administration's resolve to defeat banditry. President Tinubu said those who resorted to kidnapping children are cowards, capable of confronting the might of the Nigerian armed forces. Let's share this story with you. Sometimes it's the story that calls. At other times, the people just want to be heard. Oh, I need students, but I need teacher. You can't continue like this. Their voices were echoing through time itself. We haven't done anything. If the, the tide is high, everybody run for safety. Their tears leave a sweet, sour taste for all. Their demands, a familiar call beckoning for change. In our world, no one expects a disaster to happen. But when it does, 
We'll be there to x-ray all signs from the east to the west, north and south. Committee Forum will examine the oddities and challenges to economic development as well as issues yearning for government intervention. Watch fresh episodes of Community Forum on Sundays by 9.30 p.m. only on TVC News. It's not a regular show. It's an online interactive session where we share my views on the everyday issues that cut across politics, security, health, current affairs, governance, and so much more. I am passionate about our country. I choose to support any conversation geared towards building a better Nigeria. Join me every Saturday on TVC News YouTube channel as I discuss Nigeria and the world at large on the show, The Shows with GD. Information is power. Information is security. Information is knowledge. On labor lands, we believe that working people around the world have real questions of their own. They want to know how the world of work operates, what it means to them. We're watching journalist hangouts, and I've been speaking with Babajide Kolade Tutoju and Majid Jamil. Yes, um, there is no doubt in the fact that insecurity ravaging some parts of Nigeria requires drastic measures to curtail. As such, President Bola Tinubu has reiterated his administration's resolve to defeat banditry. President Tinubu said those who resorted to kidnapping children are cowards, incapable of confronting the might of Nigerian armed forces. Let's share this story with you. We are working hard. Yes, the bandits just need a cold uh, resolve when we say kidnappers are terrorists and don't rule against us. That's the way we pursue them. That is the way we must speak to them. And That is a fact that we are facing currently, unless we take very strong action against these people. They become cowardly, they have been degraded, they look for soft targets, they go to backyard of, uh, you know, local tools, kidnap children and kids. We must treat them equally as terrorists uh, in order to really get rid of them. And I promise you, we're going to get rid of them. President Bala Ahmed Tinobu talking there and uh, talking tough against uh, terrorists. Well, he said that we should um, treat kidnappers as um, terrorists. What broad implications do you think this would have in our prosecution of uh, war against insurgency in Nigeria? Really, it is not even about calling them terrorists. That is not the new thing. And branding them terrorists will not necessarily inflict defeat on them. No. We branded them terrorists since I think 2022 or so, or 2021. What has changed? That is not the, really the issue. The governor of Zamfara State went to see the president because bandits have had a reign of terror in that state for the past few weeks, especially in Safi local government and Zurmi local government. And the president went, I mean, went to see the president. And the president said, he approved that drastic measures should be taken against these terrorists. That is the story. That is what we've come here to talk about, not the president uh, talking about them being terrorists. Yes, yeah. 
God has no, no relationship with Zamfara in this. Zamfara is a big issue in our country today. The in level of insecurity, the big bandits, it is in Zamfara that they have found a home. And the governor knows that no part of our country has seen constant attacking of schools, kidnapping of university students with the uh, frequency that is happening in Zamfara. That's why it makes it a national shame. Mm. And the governor had to go and meet the president yesterday. He said, Mr. President, what do we do? And the president approved that drastic measures should be taken. When a president approves that drastic measures should be taken against the enemies of the state, it has great implications. It means that he has approved that the troops must go on more on the offensive, more on the kinetic approach. There are times when the rule of engagement limits the capacity of troops to deal decisively with the enemy. When the president approves that drastic measures must be taken, it means that the troops can go outside of the rule of engagement a conventional to deal decisively with the enemy. And when you have that, you have the backing of your commander-in-chief. People must bear in mind the weight of spoken words. That is why I want to see what begins to happen in the next few days. It is a matter of shame that the kids who are kidnapped in Kaduna, they ended up in, uh, in Zamfara. When they kidnapped the uh, government science uh, secondary school, Kankara boys, it was also the same Zamfara. Zamfara. Zamfara is just more them. like a haven for them. So how can people permit that to happen? The, the children who were taken from, from uh, 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 that uh, community, they were taken through cattle routes on motorbikes and taken to Safe. The, the, the forest, the Brenengwari forest, leads to Bukuyum local government in Zamfara. Bukurum, Bukuyum local government is one local government in Zamfara where you have native Christians. I've been there before. Mm. So it's, it's, you can move from that forest straight into Zamfara. Right. You can move from that forest straight into two wards in Safe local government. Right. And the armed forces know where why we cannot, why we are wasting time about wasting them. It's what, it's what I fail to understand. Right. It's what I, I don't get it. Right. Uh, MJ, let, let me come to you. Well, the president says, and I quote, that those who resorted to kidnapping children are cowards, incapable of confronting the might of the Nigerian armed forces. Uh, do you feel that the president somewhat downplayed the daring nature and the viciousness of these you know, so-called terrorists? Because we've seen them attacked, you know, lay, laid ambush, ambush on the Nigerian army and also um, assaulted or launched some sort of you know, attack an affront on the, on the armory. No, the, the president only reinforced the fact that uh, where, I mean, kidnapping is, some, is not something we should uh, treat with uh, kids' uh, gloves. He's saying that drastic measures, extreme you know, security issues are not issues that the president will not want to talk about in the open. He just is like giving express approval to the military and security operatives to deal decisively with these characters, uh, these terrorists. I mean, they are terrorists, as like the president said, they are not kidnappers. They should be treated as terrorists, and the kind of uh, treatment you give to terrorists is the kind of the treatment you give to them. Because um, why is Samfara so much in the, in the box? Because that notorious uh, 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 bandits, 
Kidna um, uh, uh, Belu uh, Kachala Toji is still at large to the extent that in, in January he killed some policemen and now put on uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the killed policemen's uniform and went on a, a video which went viral that he has now been recruited to the Nigerian police. I mean, uh, ban I mean, uh, brandishing the, uh, the the uniform and also with is is one of the most deadly bandits in Nigeria today, and I believe that he has a hand in most of this uh, kidnapping because his base is in uh, Safara. And like Gide said, it's unspeakable and, and it's incomprehensible that 137 kids uh, were moved away from Kaduna and nobody could uh, uh, have a trace of them in their tracks. from Kaduna to Safara. Even if they passed through on, in, in, inside water, they ought to have met some people. They passed through villages. There are villages in Villages. The and this still didn't happen at night, like uh, uh, the, the, the case of the Shibo girls. They were holding morning assembly at 8 a.m. when these characters came and took them in 137. So it's something that we have to deal with with maximum force. If, if need be, eliminate all, all, all of them. So, so what it means is they will get more resources now, more hardware, and probably more troops. That's when, when you hear a president say, I'm permitting drastic, yeah, measures. drastic it's, measures. It's more like, okay, I've declared a state of emergency. Yeah. Because the, rule, the rules of engagement are restrictive. Yeah. It means that they, they will have to relax and use more of kinetic approach. And if they will follow the president's directive to the letter, honestly, I see change. some significant things happening. That's right. But let's wait and see. That's right. We'll definitely wait. And then we have no much time to, to wait because we want to see results as soon as we can. Right, let's move on because of our time. The efforts to bring sanity to foreign exchange markets in Nigeria are being intensified. The governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Olayemi Kadoso, has revealed that security agencies, including the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, are investigating questionable forex allocations and forward contracts estimated at $2.4 billion. The development followed the conclusion of the audit of $7 billion debt inherited by the Kadoso-led CBN from the previous administration of the Apex Bank. The CBN governor disclosed that security agencies are investigating the forex transactions and have been declared invalid by the audit report. Uh, Bikio, uh, let me quickly ask you this. You know, help us understand the findings of the Deloitte FX audit report and the implications of the $2.4 billion invalid request highlighted by the Central Bank of Nigeria. Government. Yeah, the CBN governor told us um, um, some weeks back that some people who did not even request for forex got forex allocated to them they were looking at the books looking at what transpired before they uh, came on the scene and he said in some cases some got allocation of forex more than they even demanded for how did that happen that is it happened in the era of the worst CBN governor in Nigerian history. The worst. Under whose watch a president's signature was forged. forged and they moved money with the intention of paying European um, ele election observers. In quotes. Do they, do they pay <laughs> observers? The EU pays these people and they send them to uh, yeah, to some yes. yeah. But it, our own CBN took it upon itself to pay. CBN is not neck. Huh? CBN is not neck. What's their business? <sighs> so uh, CBN is not CSO. So many things happened. <laughs> or NGOs. So many things happened. You see, we have now seen the benefit of proper running of the forex market 
look at the regulations, look at the guidelines that have come to help us sanitize the sector. Look at the facts, look at the way your friends are running a task now to dispose the dollars in their hands. Some of them have almost run mad. <laughs> you bought dollars for 1,800 1, naira. <laughs> You thought it would go to 2,500. Now they asked, they've been asked to sell it 1,260. Because they were. It is not in our lifetime. <laughs> if you come to the world a different person, it is during your own time that it, Naira will exchange for 2,500. Mm. Some people are actually, you know, praying fervently to, for, two, for Naira to hit. They are the ones. Some, some, are, the ones some are saying it will get to 2,500 and they were, they were busy buying. Yes. <laughs> That's the thing. Now, now, they are hitting their heads against the wall, you know, like a crazed uh, bull. They are you still know? very optimistic, you know. That it will still go they to surprise the... you, definitely. Okay, they those guys... They well, are still you, you, <laughs> forecasting. Those guys that you spend your time going to their timelines on Twitter. <laughs> you know, for, for, for your sanity, there are certain people that you should not even bother to read there. whatever they post. <laughs> Just treat them like they don't exist. Mm. If you want your sanity to be intact, you, this, is, this is what we are talking about. Banks are complicit in the destruction of the forex markets, what they turn the forex market to. This is a crooked market where a good number of people are not playing by the rules. And that's why there's a need to look at that sector. Let's punish the people who moved $2.4 billion, that's a lot of money. That's right, there cannot be closure to that matter until we have dealt decisively with this kind of people so that they can tell their children the story. When they come out of prison, they can tell their children, I hope we will find the courage to jail them. Absolutely. When they come out of prison, they will say, ah, this was what I did. My son, don't, don't do this. this. Don't make the mistakes that I made. You know, when the father is on his dying bed, mm. He starts relaying some of his escapes. Yes, yes, yeah. Don't make the mistakes that I made. God will be with you, this and that. I, I didn't get the benefit of good advice. That's why I made some mistakes. You, my son, I don't want you to repeat the mistakes that I've made. That's right. They will confess to their children how they ended up in jail. And destroying Nigeria. Yes, so the EFCC should do the needful. Bank chiefs permit some of these things to happen. We need to look closely at those bank chiefs right. because they are part of our problem. MJ, um, with regards to directive for deposit money banks to increase their capital base, what, what do you think are the underlying motivations behind this policy and how does it you know, tie into Nigeria's economic growth? Yes, uh, you know, we have um, three types of uh, banks now. We have uh, the regional banks, with a capital base of uh, like 10 billion. We have the um, national banks with a capital base of uh, uh, I think 15 billion. And we have, um, no sorry, with 25 billion. And we have the international banks, I mean, like the likes of Access GT that can have branches outside of Nigeria with a capital base of 50 billion. Yeah, our first bank. Now, uh, Cardoso is saying that for Nigeria to hit the one trillion dollar economy by 2026, then our banks must have the capacity to fund big ticket transactions. Now, how are we able to do this without these banks playing the crooked ways of all these forex things we see? Um, is to ensure that they increase their capital base so that they can be real, they, can, they can be called banks in the real sense of it. it can be called deposit money banks in the real sense of it and how are they doing this uh, look at uh, the uh, Caruso inherited a, a, a deficit of seven billion uh, dollars in uh, uh, commitments made by uh, the worst CBN governor we've had in history and uh, that's uh, Godwin Emefele um, that guy is the most clueless uh, CBN governor I've ever seen. Decidedly clueless. Very, very clueless. I mean, he was just he was donating 
dollars as if it was going out of a circulation. And I, I, I don't know how ashamed it would be now wherever he is. For somebody, for, for, yeah, for somebody to, to come and within uh, six months we are able to figure out that out of the seven billion that you claim that, that the CBN was obligated to pay out, they discovered that they not discovered out that there are some people they were even allocated the money without asking for it. Ask for it. There are there are some people and before you can ask for this thing, you will they deposit naira. You, you will deposit naira with the CBN account. They got there, they discovered that there was no naira equivalent for these dollars that we have allocated to these banks. Then some of these banks came this and they are head of treasuries. They will have their asses fried seriously in the next few uh, uh, days because they are also culpable. That's right. And imagine where a CBN where you move out $6.2 million, not Naira, six, that's billions of Naira, $6.2 million, quote and unquote, for payment to elect, elect, election observers. Right. Who does that? You are not even INEC. You are not uh, the NSA. What is your business with the payment of election observers? Election observers, international observers, right. that has been paid well, by, their, by, by, their, their, by their countries. Right. We, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't have much, we don't have much time. I've been, just been told that we have about um, a minute to go. Uh, BK, but very quickly, I want you to you know, um, give your uh, final thoughts on the fact that... Have a minute to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got, we've got, we've got um, commercial. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the questionable FX allocations, you know, this ongoing investigation... Uh, how do you think it will impact on investors' confidence in Nigeria, you know, um, Nigeria's economy, particularly in terms of foreign investment? Very quickly. Already, investors are investing in Nigerian assets. That is one of the reasons why there has improved liquidity, which has impacted on the uh, mm. value of our currency. Yeah. People are asking the question, where are they seeing these dollars from? Yeah. Silly questions on social media. Where are they? I hope they are not borrowing. I hope in the press statement that the CBN governor issued, yeah. he put it there, the last paragraph, it was there that improved diaspora remittances, remittances. and foreign investment right. in Nigerian assets. Right, so if they had even bothered to read to the end, the answer to the questions they keep asking was yeah. And also the, the, the crude oil payments that was initially going to NMPC is now going directly to the that CBN. Yes. Right. yes. Right. We and, definitely see how, the, these how these things, these things will help us yeah. in the final analysis. Yeah. Investor confidence has already leaped yeah. from the fact that we were able to clear that for a, the current backlog Backlogs, yeah. is giving people confidence that if they come to invest in Nigeria, they'll be able to repatriate. Today, the, na the Naira is 1,300 Naira. Absolutely. 1,300 to 1,350. Absolutely. We'll continue to and monitor still going down. trends and, and, see how, and see how this is going to help, you know, the, the economy of the Nigeria, you know, on a broader level. Baba Jide Ekolade Tutuju, thank you so much for your keenness of insight. I am Shita, thank you. <laughs> Majid Jamil, thank you so much too for, yeah, you uh, for welcome. your time and all of the analysis that you provide. On Journalist Hangout today. That's it on Journalist Hangout today. Join us tomorrow for another episode of the program. You can watch the feed broadcast of this episode tonight at 11. Join us on Sunday from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. for Journalist Hangout on Sunday. We are on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash TVC News Nigeria. I'm Ibrahim Shita. Bye for now and God bless Nigeria. Sometimes it's the story that calls. At other times, the people just want to be heard. Oh, I need students, but I need teacher. You can't continue like this. Their voices were echoing through time itself. We haven't done anything. If the, the tide is high, everybody run for safety. Their tears leave a sweet, sour taste for all. Their demands, a familiar call beckoning for change. In our world, no one expects a disaster to happen. But when it does, we'll be there to x-ray all sides, from the east to the west, north and south. Committee Forum will examine the oddities and challenges to economic development, as well as issues yearning for government intervention. Watch fresh episodes of Community Forum on Sundays by 9.30 p.m. only on TVC News.
আমার রেগুলার শো জানো অনলাইন ইন্টারাকটিভ সেশন ওয়া উই শেয়ার মাই ভিউজ অন দি এভরিডে ইস্যুস দ্যাট কট অ্যাকস পলিটিক্স সিকিউরিটি হেলথ কারেন্ট অ্যাফেয়ার্স গভর্নেন্স এন্ড সো মাচ মোর আই অ্যাম প্যাশনেট অ্যাবাউট আওয়ার কান্ট্রি আই চুজ টু সাপোর্ট এনি কনভারসেশন ডিয়ার টু ওয়াজ বিল্ডিং এ বেটার নাইজেরিয়া Abajide College of Tutoju. Join me every Saturday on TVC News YouTube channel as I discuss Nigeria and the world at large on the show, The Shows with Jide. Information is power. Information is security. Information is knowledge. On Label Lens, we believe that working people around the world have real questions of their own. They want to know how the world of work operates, what it means to the employer of labor, how policies affect workers in the workplace. On Label Lens, I ensure we engage effectively the organized labor, organized private sector and governments to get out of them information workers are in need of. I am Sharon Ijasson, asking questions that make you get sense of the workplace. Albert Chinua Lumogo Achebe was born November 16, 1930 in Ogidi, Nigeria. He went to government college in Umuahia, Nigeria. In 1948, Achebe won a scholarship to the University of Ibadan to study medicine. But after a year, he changed his major to writing. After graduation in 1953, he became a script writer for the Nigerian Broadcasting Service, NBS, eventually becoming the head programmer for the discussion series. In 1956, he visited London for the first time to take a training course with the BBC. On returning, he moved to Enugu and edited and produced stories for the NBS. Achebe was unhappy with books about Africa written by British authors such as Joseph Conrad and John Buchan because he felt the descriptions of African people were inaccurate and insulting. In his spare time, he worked on Things Fall Apart. The novel was published in 1958. The book won immediate international recognition and also became the basis for a play. His second book, No Longer at Eve, published in 1960, is set in the last decade before Nigeria achieved independence. In 1961, Chinua Achebe met and married Christiana Chinwe Okoli and they eventually had four children. The third book in the African trilogy, Arrow of God, was published in 1964. Achebe published his fourth novel, a Man of the People in 1966. The novel tells a story of the widespread corruption of Nigerian politicians and ends in a military coup. During the Biafra conflict, Achebe's house was bombed and his friend Christopher Okimi was killed. Achebe and his family went into hiding in Biafra and then fled to Britain for the duration of the war. From 1972 to 1976, Achebe held a visiting professorship in African literature at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. After that, he returned again to teach at the University of Nigeria. He became chair of the Association of Nigerian Writers and edited Uwandi Igbo, a journal of Igbo life and culture. Although he wrote many essays and kept involved with the writing community, Achebe did not write another book until 1988's Ant Hills of the Savannah. In 1990, Achebe was involved in a car crash in Nigeria, which damaged his spine so badly he was paralyzed from the waist down. Bard College in New York offered him a teaching job and the facilities to make that possible and he taught there from 1991 to 2009. In 2009, Achebe became a professor of African studies at Brown University. In 2012, he published the essay, There Was a Country, a Personal History of Biafra. Achebe won the Man Booker International Prize for his life's work in 2007 and received more than 30 honorary doctorates. He remained critical of the corruption of Nigerian politicians, condemning those that stole or squandered the nation's oil reserves. In addition to his own literary success, he was a passionate and active supporter of African writers. However, Achebe died in Boston, Massachusetts on March 21, 2013 after a brief illness. 
He is credited with changing the face of world literature by presenting the effects of European colonization from the point of view of Africans. He specifically wrote in English, a choice that received some criticism, but his intent was to speak to the whole world about the real problems that the influence of Western missionaries and colonialists created in Africa. His life was an inspiration and sentimental to Western culture, promoting customs and values about traditional African society. You're watching Beyond 100 Days with Nifemi Oguntoye. Join the conversation right now on X using hashtag Beyond 100 Days. Remember to tag at TVC News NG. The remains of the 17 Nigerian Army personnel killed in the Okoma community in Delta State have been laid to rest with um, a military guard of honor at the National Military Cemetery in Abuja. Many dignitaries were in attendance, including the President of Nigeria, Bola Ahmed Tinubu. President of the Senate um, was ably represented, and the uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Governors of States, Ministers, and other members of the Federal Executive Council, as well as Chief of Defense Staff, Chief of Army Staff, and Chief of the Air Staff, um, including families and friends, among others. Family members uh, we saw in the live um, video and sober reflection, uh, grief in the departed souls and tears and sorrow. The Chief of Army Staff. Uh, indeed command the effort of the gallant officers killed in the hands of those he called enemies of state. The army chief describes the act of gruesome murder of the gallant soldiers as most barbaric. As the army remains committed to the protection of lives and property of Nigerians and to bring the perpetrators to book. Correspondingly, and intriguingly, my men know that when I send them out, despite the equipment, training, and other forms of preparation, sometimes some may not make it back alive, while some may return handicapped and invalid. As is a profession that deals with matters of life and death. When soldiers die in the hands of the enemies of the state, we take it as dying for what the nation has considered a just cause. We celebrate them as gallant heroes. But when they are gruesomely murdered by the very people they are trained he killed and took an oath to protect. It is highly demoralizing. On behalf of a grateful nation, we honor the sacrifice of Ali and the other gallant patriots who died that day. They will forever be remembered as heroes who answer the call of duty and paid the ultimate price. We have acknowledged your sacrifices to defend our country. It is now our duty to protect the families of our departed heroes. The federal government will provide housing in any part of our country to each of the families of the four officers and 13 soldiers that were among them. The federal government has also approved scholarship to all children of the disease up to university level. Including those who are in the womb.
Recall that on the 14th of March this year, suspected hoodlums ambushed and murdered the commanding officer of 181 Army Amphibious Battalion, two majors, one captain and 13 soldiers at Okwama community in Delta State. The troops were ambushed and killed while responding to a distress call during a clash between two communities in the south-southern state. And you had the president there talking about honoring the sacrifice of gallant soldiers who will be remembered as heroes uh, who paid the ultimate price. And prior to the promise of um, houses and scholarship to the children of the deceased, President Tinubu also honored the um, soldiers of four officers, 13 soldiers killed in Delta with posthumous national honor. According to Mr. President, the four gallant officers are accorded the awards of the members of the Order of Niger MON, the 13 courageous soldiers awarded officers of the Federal Republic Medal. And also, we're following very closely all the details from that particular event. Tidal's correspondent Femi Akonde joins me live from phone. Femi, a uh, very sad development, a really sad day watching the barrier service today. We're going to talk about the president's um, speech shortly, but talk to us about what the emotions are like, you know, at that barrier service and the dignitaries that attended. And the world's yes, it was and the of the armed forces, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, of the armed 17 of them lowered into their graves after being killed in and the line of duty in a Kwama community in uh it was really a sober moment for uh, Mr. President to uh, families of these fallen heroes, you know, and also the uh, entire uh, of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. President told them, he urged them not to be deterred by this uh, situation, and he assured that he will continue to do all as president to ensure that he supports the military, supports uh, the armed forces in their fight against the enemies of the country. I know it also is for the armed um, forces uh, to have President Bola Tinobu physically attend, uh, physically attend uh, this uh, funeral. This is the first time in a long time that anything like this happened. We've had soldiers die in the lack of duty. Uh, they have been buried. Um, the highest minister of defense, the chief of army staff, chief of defense staff, that you know, the president and commander in chief sitting in person to um, witness um, this funeral and making uh, strong words, assuring them that indeed the administration will continue to support um, the army. This means a lot and would also boost um, the morale of um, the armed forces moving forward. And you know that he also gave them, uh, that is the following deal, humorous uh, national, uh, national honors. So uh, we are a big one. Even if you have, if you go online, if any, you will see the post of and everyone commending President Bolatino for attending um, this funeral, showing that indeed he is the chief of the armed forces and the fight for these uh, men means so much to him. Let me. Absolutely, the boss is high on Mr. President's uh, presence there and also the promise of houses and scholarship to the children of the deceased. State House Correspondent Femi Akonde live for us from Abuja. We'll talk more about security across the country, the implication of the incident in Delta, as well as Mr. President's pronouncement on the issue of kidnapping. But that's after this break. Stay with us, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Beyond 100 Days. I am Nifemi Ogutoye. Joining me now is former director of the Department of State Services, Denis Zamakri, um, on the program. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's begin with the barrier um, service for the four officers and 13 soldiers that were killed in Delta State. What do you make of um, the federal government's commitment? Um, we heard the president earlier saying that houses will be given to the family of the deceased in any part of the country and that there's also scholarship all the way to university level for all the children of the deceased, including those in the womb. 
Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's really a sad, sad situation where we have to see our soldiers, you know, officers and men, you know, we, who are uh, killed brutally, uh, being buried right in front of us. Not outside the country, they didn't go to fight outside the country, but uh, were killed within the country. And it's a very, very sad incident. Um, and then, of course, in our sorrow, we should also think about the lessons that we learned from this particular one. We soldiers are trained to protect Nigerians uh, from external aggression, um, not internal. Uh, if it's internal, the police can handle it. But uh, if it's um, happening like this and we have to lose our men, then we have to rejig it and then look at it properly to make sure that we don't put our soldiers in harm's way. Mm. You know, your position seemed to have been buttressed by um, the immediate past chief of defense staff, General Lucky Rabo, who mentioned that to prevent a recurrence, we, we must have a conversation around limiting aid to civil authority. He did say that yes. military must avoid what he called the sea finish syndrome uh, while embarking on non-kinetic operations. Um, so there is there is there is need to encourage non kinetic operations and community engagements. But um, what are the limits? You know, should the military be first responders in, in situations such as the um, community clash in Delta State? The standing agreement is that uh, the military is responsible for external aggressions and then uh, protecting the uh, territorial integrity of the country. Internal security is meant for police, you know, and then, of course, uh, if the police is overwhelmed, and that is what the clause said, if police is overwhelmed, then they can call for assistance from the military. And we've done that, but it has been overdone, whereby in more than 20 states, you have the military involved in one kind of operation or the other. You know, and of course, there are many that we don't hear the casualties. These ones, uh, the, the, because of the gruesome way that they were killed, we are hearing about it. Uh, soldiers have been killed a lot in different areas, especially in the north, when they were facing uh, Boko Haram or um, Iswa. You know, so uh, we have to look at it again. Keep the military where they should be. Prepare them for any kind of aggression. Because we are forgetting something. Um, our neighbors don't like us. Our neighbors don't like us at all. Uh, we have Niger, they are looking at us seriously. Burkina Faso, all of them, you know, all these uh, French speaking uh, military governments. And um, we should not be busy within our house while we forget about keeping an eye on them. Uh. Then the police try and train them. They are the same Nigerians that are in the military or in the, in the police. Train them so that they can up their, you know, capability and capacity, you know, to fight any kind of terrorism within the borders of our country. Well, what do you make of the audacity not only to attack the military, but to kill 17? Because, you know, usually Nigerians are scared of military personnel. I mean, you wear... You wear the uniform, you know what you go through, um, you know, if they catch you in their camel. What do you think, um, is there a bigger picture to what happened in Delta that we're not paying attention to? You know, um, after the war, we were kids then. And uh, when uh, the soldiers were parading, the Nigerian army uh, come to town, a group of us, kids, will be following them following them as they march down the road, you know, and after that, we don't see them again because they were like special set of people. But now you see soldiers everywhere. You see them in the market. You see them in the, on the road, uh, at checkpoints. Sometimes they are fighting with police. Police is fighting back with them, you know, and stuff like that. So it is one that... We have to really, really be serious about the parameters 
where they operate, putting them in the right places, you know. And if we feel that um, we have too many uh, soldiers to spare because we are, this is not wartime, then let them uh, um, uh, re be redeployed into the police. You know, here in the United States, you find out that most of the policemen that are patrolling the streets, some of them are just coming from Afghanistan, some of them are Marines, you know, and stuff like that. So um, it is one that we, we are all working for the same country. It is not one that uh, uh, you look down on one or you look high on the other one, you know. So uh, let, let, let us um, reorder our priorities. This seeming frequent deployment of soldiers, is it an indictment on the capacity of the police or it's a function of not having enough police personnel, you know, across the country? What do you think the real challenge is? Uh, it's both. It's both. Uh, first of all, it's indictment on the police because they are not well trained to handle it. So they have to call for the military to come in well trained i stress training you know the, the inspector general has uh, formed a special intervention uh, unit you know and uh, this unit is supposed to be well trained i don't know the level of training but they should be well trained you know that is the first one the second one is um uh, they are not enough we don't have enough policemen in Nigeria. We are 200 million, more than 200 million. And then we have only about mm, half a million, half a million policemen, give or take. And then of course, about one quarter of those people are Mopos that are already attached to uh, politicians and other uh, network individuals who can pay for their services. You know, so you find out that the ones left to take care of the society are very few. Uh, and they cannot do that. You know, so I think we have to recruit more, train them properly, reorder our priorities so that we don't send the police that is going to fight crime or protect the citizens in following around the local government chairman or senators and stuff like that. If they want bodyguards, they can go to private security uh, who can have who have trained bodyguards to take care of them. Let us touch on the second item on our discussion, and it has to do with Mr. President's recent um, statement on kidnappers. We must treat kidnappers as terrorists. That's the message coming from President Tinubu as he condemns the reprehensible acts perpetrated by kidnappers across the country. He made the declaration at a Ramadan dinner with members of the federal judiciary led by the chief justice of Nigeria. And uh, we also heard him reiterate government's resolve to defeat banditry. He actually said, and I'm quoting him now, that we must treat kidnappers as terrorists. They are cowardly. They have been degraded. They look for soft targets, end quote. I'd like us to look at um, how much impact prescribing groups as terrorists have had on the fight against criminality we've seen against IPOP, I think against um, IMN, and which other group was that? Do you think um, this, this will also help um, defeat the, the huge challenge of um, abduction that we are recording across the country? Well, um, I hope that he was properly advised because uh, the president, whether he was properly advised, because that has been, you know, there is a judgment which have classified bandits as terrorists in Nigeria already. You know, remember, if you remember very well, we went to court when we wanted to buy the Tokano jets. The Americans were refusing to sell it because they felt that we were going to use it on civilians. Now, bandits are known as civilians. They are classified as civilians because they are a gang of thieves. They are just like thieves, you know, a gang of robbers who are going around. They are civilians and, you know, they will, they will, they will deal with them as civilians. But we wanted to call them terrorists. 
That way they could sell us the Tokano jets because a terrorist is somebody, a non-state actor who has carried arms, sometimes very sophisticated ones, against the state. And that's what terrorists are. You know, and of course, to satisfy the purchase of that particular, uh, those uh, Tokano jets, we went to court where the bandits were declared to be terrorists. And it was when we declared them as terrorists that this, the Tokano jets were sold to us. We have them now, you know. But again, like I said earlier, that is not what we use in fighting uh, terrorists or insurgents. Because these guys, if we train the police very well, the special intervention uh, squad by the, uh, um, by the IGP, you know, could be trained just like SWATs in the United States. Special weapons and tactics. The kind of weapons they're going to use is not just the AK-47 or the grenade launchers that uh, the, the, the terrorists are, ca are carrying around. You know, and then of course they will be fully equipped. Uh, give them attack helicopters so that if there is any kind of any kind of event, they should, their response capability would be very very high. So that if there's something is happening like in Kuriga, and the, the the information has got to the headquarters of uh, the special intervention force, you know. They should get themselves ready, and then in 15 minutes, they should be airborne. And then? You know, <laughs> going to that area and looking yes. for, you know, those people. You know, we have um, many terms really? for them now. That there are bandits, armed bandits, unknown gunmen, kidnappers. It's hard to tell, you know, if all of this fits into, you know, the, They're all terrorists. the bandits they are that... All terrorists. Yes. yes. But I spoke, I spoke with the Kaduna State Governor earlier, who mentioned that... Um, some 200 police personnel have now been, you know, deployed to the state with two APCs. Let's talk about what must be done to prevent abduction in large scale like we've seen in the past one month. Um, is it a function of uh, police presence and infrastructure or intelligence, you know, what do you think is missing really? Uh, intelligence should not miss. I think uh, the military intelligence or, well, the SSS intelligence department uh, is doing that on a daily basis. I'm sure they are tasking their sources, you know, even among the bandits, you know, to give them current actionable intelligence. But parking is just like we do with elections. There's going to be an election in Ondo State, and then we take 300 policemen and we'll go and dump them inside Ondo, you know, uh, to monitor the election. That is not the way. That's not the way. I, I think there are people, strategists in the police that can advise on this, you know, because what we are looking at is not a matter of where you, you uh, throw money at it and then it will go away, or throw policemen into it and then it, it will go away. The presence of policemen will serve only one. It will serve deter deterrence, you know. It will deter the, 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 the terrorists to know that, yes, if I do this, I might not get away alive. That is a deterrence factor, whereby this, their presence should always be there in the markets, on the road, not particularly.